Okay, so good evening and welcome to the um, C4 von Neumann Public Lectures in Complexity and Collective Computation. I'm Jessica Fleck, and I'm the director of C4 here in WID. And um, just one point of business, the next lecture is going to be Wednesday, May 13th. Michael Mobison, head of global strategies at Credit Suisse, an adjunct professor at Columbia Business School, will be giving a talk on the science of success and extreme talent and the role that luck plays in generating outstanding performance. And he's really a great speaker and he's written a great book called The Success Equation, so please join us for that. That's May 13th. Now tonight's public lecture um, is going to be given by Josh Epstein here, who I will introduce momentarily, and it's about how we can study and make comprehensible the seemingly complex social phenomena that we've all been hearing lots about, for example, the distribution of wealth, the income distribution, why some societies are egalitarian or, and others are more despotic, and even things like how obesity spreads. So um, Josh is going to propose that a powerful tool for studying these kinds of social phenomena is a modeling framework called agent-based modeling. Now, in agent-based modeling, the designer simulates the actions and interactions of uh, autonomous components, so the Dalek in our poster, of course, the lecture poster, is um, such an agent, a quite simple one. And these agents can be, can be individuals or they can be groups like firms. And what we're interested in is, the, is assessing the effects of their, their interactions on the, on, the, on the system itself. So how do aggregate level properties like the distribution of wealth arise from individual interactions and decision making? Now, um, why is this interesting? This seems like science. Well, this approach to understanding social phenomena stands in actually quite stark contrast to uh, maybe what you might call more traditional modeling approaches like game theory, which we've heard something about in this series. And um, these kinds of appro approaches tend to focus on the behavior of the system at what we call equilibrium. And they also are um, phenomenological. And what I mean by that is the models are intended to capture the essence of the system, something quite simple. Um, and they don't typically track all of the individuals and their interactions. So it's a very different strategy for studying these kinds of problems. And um, of course, those of you who have been regularly attending this lecture will um, be expecting that somehow this is going to be tied back to John von Neumann, and of course it is. So John von Neumann invented this thing called the von Neumann machine. And the von Neumann machine is a theoretical machine that, given a very precise set of instructions, can copy itself. Now, the ideas for the von Neumann machine led to something called cellular automata, which in turn led to something that you probably have heard of. Um, it's called John Conway's uh, very famous um, game of life, and that was the sort of first in situ demonstration of how simple rules can generate quite complex patterns in a virtual world. Okay? Now, in the 1990s, so agent-based modeling was relatively rare until about the 1990s. And in the 1990s, it exploded because computational power really increased. Computing became really important. And um, simultaneously, as it exploded, it became quite controversial. And by that, I mean that there are many scientists building models that seem to be as complex as the phenomena in nature that they, s they sought to understand. So this, this is a bit like if you're familiar with um, Jorge Luis Borges, this story. I may, have, um, I may have mentioned this before. It's one of my favorite stories on exactitude in science. And um, it's a very short, very precise story. And I'm just going to read you the first part of it now to capture this idea. So Borges wrote, in that empire, the art of cartography attained such perfection that the map of a single province occupied the entirety of a city, and the map of the empire, the entirety of a province. In time, those unconscionable maps no longer satisfied, and the Cartographer's Guild struck a map of the empire whose size was that of the empire, and which coincided point for point with it. The following generations, who were not so fond of the study of cartography as their forebears had been, saw that the vast map was essentially useless. All right, so this sort of captures the controversy about agent-based modeling, but don't despair, because just as there are good and useful maps, there are useful and um, principled agent-based models. And Josh Epstein is one of the foundational figures in this figure in this world of agent-based modeling. And he's going to tell us tonight how one can use these models to learn about the seemingly intractable social phenomena that I described, and also how one can do so rigorously. So Josh is an extremely accomplished guy. He's a professor of emergency medicine at Johns Hopkins University. He's the director of the Johns Hopkins University Center for Advanced Modeling and the Behavioral 
Social and Health Sciences, and the co-director of Johns Hopkins Systems Institute, and he's external professor at the Santa Fe Institute. He was formerly a fellow at the Brookings Institution. He's co-authored seven books, many of them on um, agent-based modeling and, and related phenomena. Some of them you may know, Growing Artificial Societies is one. Another is um, Nonlinear Dynamics, Mathematical Biology, and Social Science. And of course, his most recent book, Agent Zero, which I have here, in case any of you are interested in reading it. Very nice book, just, just recently out. And um, Epstein, of course, holds a BA from Amherst College, and he did his PhD at MIT. He's taught at Princeton and Johns Hopkins. And in 2008, he received NIH's Director's Pioneer Award, which is for um, you know uh, cutting edge work, cutting edge work, and it's one of NIH's only such awards. And in 2010, he was um, elected an honorary. He's given an honorary Doctorate of Science from his um, undergraduate university, Amherst. So please join me in welcoming Josh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Well, thank you, Jessica, for that really incredibly generous and nice introduction and very intelligent framing of the whole presentation. I'm honored and delighted to be here, so thank you all very much. Uh, yeah, I wanted to talk tonight about computational social science at a bunch of scales, all the way from the neuronal scale to the national scale. And I want to, I've brought lots of examples, uh, and I will show you models from literally playground level to planetary level and introduce you to this new and very confused friend of mine, Agent Zero. Uh, but first, I just wanted to run a very quick survey of the audience. Uh, how many people in the room are modelers? Just raise your hands. OK. Well, I beg to differ, because I think everyone in the room is a modeler. See, now who says human behavior isn't predictable? I thought a bunch of you would not raise your hands. But in fact, everyone is a modeler. Uh, and when you close your eyes and imagine a process, an epidemic, the spread of democracy, a migration, the effect of a tax increase, what, what have you, you're running some model. It's just an implicit mental model that you haven't written down. And so the only real choice in life is not everybody's a modeler. You're going to model things one way or the other. The only real choice is whether to do that implicitly or explicitly. And uh, explicit models, like those I will show you, have the advantages that they force you to make your own assumptions clear. They allow you to assess the sensitivity of your results to variations in your assumptions, something called sensitivity analysis. They're replicable by others, which is very important. Uh, and they're comparable to data. So in principle, one can imagine data that would falsify these models. And in fact, an underappreciated role of models is to suggest what data actually is worth collecting. Uh, we'll come back to this. And modeling, uh, I've written a little paper called Why Model, which goes through 16 reasons other than prediction to build a model. Um, and I'll show you models at various scales with various objectives, and in particular, toy models can be very illuminating and can suggest novel avenues to the solution of big, challenging problems. And also, I'll show these horrific Borges uh, models of planetary epidemics, which are not the size of the planet, not yet, but they're moving in that direction. So. Um, I want to give uh, some examples of toy models and then show these very high fidelity models and move up in scale and talk about different objectives. Um, but I believe that toy models are very valuable uh, and can give very surprising insights. And I just wanted to start in a field where agent-based modeling has had a huge impact, infectious disease modeling. I mean, I dare say that you know, agent-based modeling has really changed the way infectious disease modeling is done at NIH and, and elsewhere. But just for fun, let's start with a very toy little playground epidemic. And the idea is just kids are going to run around an idealized little playground, and we're going to color them blue if they're healthy, healthy, red if they're sick, and when a red bumps into a blue, he gives them the bug with high probability, and after you've had the bug for a while, you die. Well, uh, one way or the other, you eventually die. So it's ultimately, it's highly transmissible and ultimately lethal. And we'll just start with one sick kid on this idealized playground and talk about what happens. Okay, so here are these little kids. 
I hope people can see this and the contrast is okay lighting wise. But you know, there's 99 healthy kids and one sick kid who's red and they're gonna move around the playground. And when a red bumps into a blue, he gives them the bug with some probability. And then after a while, uh, if you've been red for a you know, little while, you just depart the landscape. You could think of that as they go to the infirmary, but I prefer to think of them as dead. <laughs> just because I'm a morbid fellow. So here it goes, and they're getting more and more kids are getting sick, and the sick kids are dying. Okay, and I've just given them nominal numbers for lethality. You know, when you've had it, you die with probability, you know, 10% per period. Okay, and I think you can see where it's going. We're rooting for these last blue kids, but I happen to know <laughs> that it doesn't end well for them. <laughs> okay, so they're gonna get this bug, and they're all gonna die. Okay, so everybody gets it, and they all die. We can watch them all die, but I think you trust me. They all die. All right. So every kid got it, and they all died. What if I now make the bug twice as lethal as it was? So instead of dying, you know, with a 10% probability, you die with a 20% probability per period. It's a more lethal bug. I make it twice as le lethal. It's worse for the individual. Is it worse for the society? You'd think, I mean, if I asked, like, the person on the street, I'm going to make the bug twice as deadly, isn't it twice as bad? I'd say, well, yeah, of course it's twice as bad. I mean, you're telling me it's twice as bad, so it's going to be twice as bad. <laughs> but let's, let's bump the lethality up by, you know, 100%. Whereas before, they all got it and everybody died. Now, fewer people get it, fewer people die, and if you measure welfare by the total number of survivors, you're actually better off with a more deadly bug in this sense. And I think that's interesting and unexpected. Some of you are ahead of the game. I noticed a few people who, who knew the answer, the modelers in the group. And this, of course, mimics mathematical models of epidemics, which we could, we could go through, but I thought, let's not do differential equations. So here's an example where it's a toy model, but it demonstrates something to my mind quite counterintuitive. That is when you make the bug more deadly, it actually is better in some social sense. So let's play another little game with this simple model. Um, let's go back to the first run where everybody gets it and they all die. And let's imagine a perfect vaccine, right? A vaccine that's perfectly effective. And imagine we have our 100 kids. I'm going to vaccinate 60 kids. OK? So 60 kids will survive, right? I mean, who thinks fewer than 60 kids? A perfect vaccine. Does anybody think fewer? It's OK. I mean, do people think fewer than 60? How many people think 60? I gave 60 people a shot. They'll live. How many people? You do. Good. And how many people think more than 60? You're a terrible audience. You're way too smart for this talk. What am I doing here? <laughs> All right, so yes, as it happens, this is the phenomenon called herd immunity. Let's cooperate. So the yellow kids are vaccinated. I've got my index case, my red case. And when all is said and done, blue kids beyond the vaccinated cohort survive. So when you get, when you vaccinate kids against the highly transmissible disease, there's all sorts of secondary protection for kids who weren't vaccinated, and this is called herd immunity. And again, there's a lot of elaborate mathematics you can do to determine what level of vaccination will actually induce the epidemic to simply fizzle. But again, it's a toy model that demonstrates something that is not obvious on, you know, when you first think about it. Um, so yeah, more than 60 survive. So I don't have to vaccinate everyone to quash the whole epidemic. It's called, I, can, I don't have to vaccinate every cow to protect the herd. That's why it's called herd immunity. So you vaccinate only until the thing fizzles. And that's an interesting question. Who do you vaccinate? How many do you need to vaccinate? And so forth. Uh, but the same could be said for the instigation of good epidemics, right? I mean, not all epidemics are bad. You want to uh, induce 
an epidemic of good behavior, like smoking cessation or adoption of a new test in a physician community or healthy eating or safe sexual practices? How do you start a good epidemic? Same, same formalism, same model could be used to how do you spread an innovation and so forth. So the general area of contagion dynamics is one where these toy models can be quite revealing and quite stimulating and produce quickly some counterintuitive results and interesting findings, all right? But let's stay with bad epidemics for a moment and talk about another use of these, what I would call toy models. Um, there was a considerable concern after 9-11, after warranted or not, uh, with bioterrorism. And there was uh, a lot of concern about smallpox at the time. Um, and I was sort of drafted, along with some other colleagues, to do some work on smallpox. Uh, and in particular, to come up with a novel vaccination strategy, which I just talked about vaccine. And there's a vaccine for smallpox. But it has uh, the problem that it's a live virus and is a very dangerous thing. And if you are immunocompromised or HIV positive or on chemotherapy or other kinds of immune suppression, one way or another, the vaccine can kill you outright. And if you have eczema or psoriasis or diaper rash, it can give you a disfiguring reaction. So, b you know, one bunch of people, policy makers, were saying, vaccinate the entire population. But that's obviously not a great idea because you'll have all sorts of terrific adverse reactions to the vaccine. The other approach is trace vaccination. Um, so Jessica walks into the emergency room. She's diagnosed as having this thing. We, find, we go out and find all her contacts in the last week and give them a shot. Sounds good on paper, but who the heck are those people if you were at O'Hare Airport or down in Times Square or whatever? So the homework was figure out a strategy that's effective in suppressing this, this epidemic is not mass vaccination and is not trace vaccination because it's infeasible. So find me some other avenue. And here's an example where I think toy models made an important contribution that a high fidelity model probably wouldn't have made. And we'll talk about this. But the idea was, okay, so build a minimal model that is revealing, that, that, that offers a novel avenue. Here, an interesting idea, okay? So we thought, build the simplest model that includes the social units that actually dominate the historical data of which there's a good deal. And those are homes, schools, workplaces, and hospitals. And it matters that there's some long-range connectivity. People commute, right, and fly around, and can spread things at long distances. So we thought, look, let's build a really toy model that includes those components. So we built this simple thing, square town and circle town, all right? And this is Square Town up here. And it's just, a, there are 100 households, two parents, two kids. It's completely unrealistic. You know, I don't know if you remember, like, Ozzy and Harriet. That's what this is, okay? This is the Ozzy and Harriet picture of domestic life. So everybody's home with their kids, two parents, two kids at night. Here's Square Town, and here's Circle Town, all right? And at night, everybody's at home. And in the day, there's work and school and the hospital and the morgue, all right? These are the big places, not the morgue but for this disease, although for Ebola, it's a big deal. All right, anyway, so it, in the day they go, and you can see that some people like Mr. Green actually start, whoops, I'm sorry, they start in Circle Town, but they work in Square Town, so they go up there and work, as do other Circle Towners, and likewise, many Square Towners work in Circle Town. All the kids go to their own town school, and some people from each community work in the hospital. So at night, they're at home, and day, and so it goes, day in, day out, in this petty pace forever, all right? Uh, and you could drop any bug into that contact dynamic that you like, and we, the framework quite general, but we used smallpox, and there's elaborate work on the biology of smallpox, but simple version for, suitable for these purposes is simply blue, you're healthy, green, you're infected but have no symptoms. That lasts a couple of weeks. Then you have an oropharyngeal rash. You can spread the thing respiratorily, then you're yellow. And then you have horrible lesions that shed virus aggressively. And then you die with probability 0.3. All right, so we're just going to run a simple case, one realization of this model. I will say, one of the things Jessica mentioned is that I'm going to show you a movie of this thing. No one should 
you know, it's one movie is just a single sample path of a stochastic process. And it's the big words for saying every time you run it, you get a different result, and you should never publish or rely on one run of any of these things. You should always run a bunch of runs and then build up a statistical portrait of model performance, and that's what you pay attention to. But I'm going to show you the eye candy run uh, where Mr. Green starts in Circle Town. All right. You can see he works up in Square Town. Pretty soon he turns yellow, gives the bug to his wife. She also works up there. Okay, and this is one run. It's interesting that even in the one run, you get a much more, he turns red, he goes to the hospital. Again, we're rooting for the poor guy, but I know that he's going north. So he goes eventually to the north. All right, and more people are, are going through the phases of this natural history of the bug. And if you just let it run, you know, everybody gets it and a third of them die, which is basically the situation in Europe before the advent of the vaccine, except for one group, who knows what group? Milkmaids, yes, it was on the tip of your tongue. And uh, it's because they got cowpox and it was sufficient to stimulate an immune response that could handle smallpox. And the first vaccines were actually, you'd poke the cow pox itself and then inoculate yourself with cowpox. That's why it's called vaccine vodka for cow. So you learn something from this silly talk that <laughs> Epstein gave. All right, and you can reconstruct these contact patterns and so forth. But the idea was typical runs look like a deformed version of the playground model, which is kind of a one-humped affair. Uh, and we tuned this model so that it actually produced the same distribution of transmissions by social units. So the data, which we published in a paper with Ira Longini and others, um, it's, you know, 50% of the transmissions are hospital, 20% are family, 20% are workplace, and so forth. So we run the thing many times and build up distributions that look a little like those. And if you look at just the data, it shows, you know, 50% of the cases are transmitted in the hospital, and another 20% are transmitted in the family. So we thought, hmm, what if you just pre-vaccinated healthcare workers right now, just vaccinate them, then you'll kill a lot of the hospital transmission. So it's not mass vaccination, but it's a selected group that has a lot of contact. Then uh, Jess walks into the ED, she's diagnosed, I can't get your whole trace, but I can shoot the household. So what if I just do preemptive vaccination of hospital workers and reactive vaccination just of household members? So it's not mass vaccination, it's not the full trace. How does that do? It does very well. I mean, it produces a huge suppression in this toy version of the model. And because it was a simple uh, model, um, it, it would, you know, uh, simple models have the advantage that, you know, if I give a big high fidelity model with a zillion agents uh, and it produces something counterintuitive, the policymaker or the audience is going to say, well, I don't know, the, that, that suggestion sounds weird to me, and I don't know what's under the hood of this model. So here's a case where you don't claim realism, you don't claim you know, predictive f fidelity or any kind of particularly exact model, but it's a toy model, everybody knows what's going on, the actual people helped us build it, you involve them in making the assumptions, and then when it produces something counterintuitive or interesting, this is a novel avenue, think about it further, the fact that it's a toy is useful because everybody understands what's going on. So I think toy models can play an important role uh, in suggesting novel approaches to very complicated problems in epidemiology and elsewhere. All right, so that's my manifesto for toy models. So. We also used historical data to inform that problem, and that's fine. We used historical data on some particular episodes. But how about trying to grow an entire civilization, an ancient civilization, who's had, we know about their settlement patterns, as Jess was saying. We know something about the macroscopic regularities. Can we generate them in one of these things? Um, so try to grow a civilization, and just apropos of nothing, um, Mahatma Gandhi was asked, what do you think of Western civilization? And he answered, I think it would be a fine idea. 
um, our civilization, this all started at the Santa Fe Institute, and I won't bore you with the details, but we decided to try to build an entire artificial history, and it's a history of a people called the Anasazi who lived in Arizona from around 800 to 1350, and then vanished you know, enigmatically, and there's this great mystery about why they left these areas, and a big debate in archaeology and anthropology about whether it was war, pestilence, environmental decline, what was it? So we thought, okay, let's, let's try to build an agent model that, you know, that replicates the observed history using what we know about the environment, which they knew a lot, actually. I was surprised at how much the archaeologists knew. But using tree ring dating and all kinds of other interesting methods, they were able to digitize the actual environmental history and, with some credibility, the demographic history. Here's where it all unfolded in a place called Longhouse Valley. It's about 100 square kilometers. Uh, and the mystery was that, you know, they, the, we know the environment fluctuated, and we have good data that can reconstruct that. And then, you know, after many, many years of ebb and flow, they left. They abandoned the valley. So why? Was it war? Was it disease? we asked, look, how powerful is a purely environmental account? So let's just do, first, uh, by tree ring dating and other methods, we digitize the entire environmental, environmental record and reconstruct that. Uh, rainfall, water tables, corn potential, for every hectare for the whole period. Then also the known, the reconstructed pattern of household settlements. And then we build little artificial Anasazi households and equip them with rules, candidate rules for, you know, when do you abandon the plot you're farming and try to move to another plot? Uh, what are good assumptions about childbearing and family size and demographic variables? And if you plop them in random positions at the beginning of simulated history, do they generate the true history, both in terms of demography, population size, and also spatial settlement patterns? So they had all this data on climate and topsoil and all sorts of other things. Uh, and very simple rules. We tried lots of different rules, of course. Um, you know, you want to live within some distance of your field. You don't want to put your house in the middle of your cornfield. That's kind of stupid. Uh, and you also want to be near potable water. And you want to ditch your current plot if it's not being productive. And you give them different criteria and search the space of behavioral rules. Uh, offspring and so forth. Um, and then death rules. I mean, there are nutritional requirements in just sort of calories that we could calculate from maize yields and other things. Uh, and here's the true landscape. On the left is uh, the actual uh, historical settlement patterns at a certain, I'll show you this on one movie of this evolution, but around 1200 AD, um, they're tracking nicely what actually happened in terms of where they put their settlements and what their population was and so forth. Um, and I'll show you a, a movie of this. Again, it's one realization of the model. And in the paper we published on this, which was in the Proceedings in the National Academy, you run many realizations of the thing and you ask where in the distribution of simulated uh, outcomes is the observed history. You the game is not, can I tune the thing and get it to do exactly what the little squirrel did? That's not the game. The game is build a statistical portrait and locate the true phenomena in that portrait. All right, so, but here's simulated on the left and history on the right. And the landscape is dark blue for high water table, light blue for low water table, white for arid, and you'll see the environment in both of these maps is the same because we're, we're using the same environmental history for the simulated Anasazi as we know for the true Anasazi. So here's one realization of the model. You know, and you'll see it, it's very arid, there's not much, not much going on. After a while, they're able to grow more corn, um, and as they you know, in, enjoy more more plentiful yields and so forth. They have more offspring. They inhabit the right places of the landscape. Population ebbs and flows with the environment. And then the true Anasazi vanish. 
and the artificial Anasazi don't. So and it suggests that, in fact, the environment was sufficient to sustain some of these people, and they must have left for reasons that are not purely environmental. So it explains some of, but not all of, their history. And this is the published, you know, sort of best fit from the, from the ensemble. And the red curve is the true, and black is the uh, generated. And, you know, there is some capacity to support Anasazi uh, who left. So it contributes to the resolution of this debate. What is the role of environmental factors? Major, but not completely determining. Um, one of the fun things that the, this work suggested that we haven't been able to do for po weird political reasons and ultimately uh, religious objections to doing anything on these lands, but the idea was the artificial Anasazi found, you know, founded settlements uh, in places that have never been excavated. So it would be really fun to take some of these places where the artificial Anasazi founded settlements and dig around and see if there were any actually there. So it's like, dig here, you might find Neptune. So do you know the story of Leverrier showed that the orbit of Uranus was not in conformity with New Newtonian mechanics, but he believed Newton's laws and concluded, well, there must be an unobserved mass, an undiscovered planet. And so the theory said, look for this, and voila, Neptune was discovered. And this, so it would be a very tiny instance of this to go dig around and see if the artificial Anasazi predicted a settlement someplace. But, but the idea of that story and what, you know, of this Neptune story uh, is just a back on a kind of philosophical level. Um, a lot of people in the social sciences and other sciences are kind of taught uh, an inductivist picture of science, where what is science? Well, first you collect a ton of data, and then you summarize the data in some statistical way, and then you develop some law that that reflects the data, that starts with data, and a law is some sort of summary of the data. But it's not the way science actually progresses at all, or not always that way. Um, and good examples are Maxwell's electromagnetic theory, which is the theoretical advance is what told people, go look for radio waves in the first place. And then people found them, but it was theory first that suggested what to look for. Same with light bending in a gravitational field from special relativity, uh, Eddington marched all over the planet to, to verify that. It's a fascinating story. Um, or the Higgs boson. I mean, Higgs developed the boson as a theoretical entity in the 60s, and finally it was discovered. But the idea is that theoretical work can direct the collection of data and inform, you know, what, what data is really worth collecting, what's important to know. So just want you to know that Theory often precedes and guides observation, and it's not this inductivist myth always. All right, and apropos of this, the whole approach that I've been pursuing, and not alone, but others, is that, and in this paper on the Anasazi, I argue for this idea of a generative explanation that I've used in other areas, but the idea is to observe, I mean, to explain an observed history, a pattern, is to specify agents that generate or grow that history. All right, so it's what, what constitutes an explanation of some social pattern. There are lots of competing approaches to this, but the one I'm exploring is this idea that when you say I've explained some large scale social regularity, like the wealth distribution or epidemic dynamics, what you're saying is I've got a micro world of plausible agents which, left to their own devices, grow that thing from the bottom up. That's the idea of this line of work. All right, and by those lights, the agent-based model goes some way toward explaining that particular history. All right, and it's a very different explanatory standard than is, as Jess was saying, the, the norm in economics and game theory, which is a whole other idea that we, I'm happy to talk about at greater length, but it's an equilibrium idea. This is a non-equilibrium decentralized, generative type of science. All right, so let's keep going. Uh, the artificial Anasazi involved some kind of natural environment, built structures, these settlements, and human behavior. So thinking of those axes, if you like, let's just fast forward 700 years and think about a much faster environmental shock 
than the, the kind of long cycles of variability you see in the Anasazi data. And imagine a really rapid shock in a modern city, in particular. Oh, that is software people. Sorry. Um, good question. All right, so let's go forward and think about an, a different kind of environmental shock in a modern city. So here we've been studying at Hopkins, uh, you know, what happens, what, what, how do you think about evacuating huge metropolises in the event of, say, a toxic plume or some other shock, a hurricane or some other thing? Um, and we've been building models that combine physics, atmospheric physics, that govern the dispersion of a toxic aerosol, for example, released in a real three-dimensional replica of major cities like Los Angeles with real traffic patterns as observed in, in data on real road systems, but we'd like it to be inhabited by agents who have some cognitive plausibility. And so here is one example of this type of synthesis of actual physics. You'll see this red cloud. It's just a neutrally buoyant aerosol. It's phosgene in this particular case. And the progress of that plume is governed by computational fluid dynamics. We know how that works. It's highly nonlinear computational work, but it's real legitimate physics. And it's impinging on a city that's been reconstructed in complete detail about these buildings and their permeability and their capacity uh, and so forth. And traffic is normal, routine traffic, uh, color-coded by velocity. And we're imagining in this run that you tell everyone, OK, we know the properties of the gas, we know the properties of the building, and we're saying, shelter in place. But instead of that, driven by fear and Twitter feeds and what have you, they pour out into the street where they produce massive congestion and they actually increase their exposure to this toxic plume. Okay, and again, this is one realization of the model, but the idea is the computing is so vast that you could pre-compute what I call petabyte playbooks for every city, a huge array of aerosols, all kinds of assumptions about the atmosphere, when it, when it happens, in what volume it happens, what are the release points, and have a huge library of responses that you would then update based on the actual you know, situation. So you say some, something is released in Pittsburgh at 5 in the morning in the middle of the summer and so forth. OK, well, that's play 5,387,000,000 the C. And we're going to update it in the following manner. And then in real time, make appropriate recommendations or something. OK? But the idea is that the work is a synthesis of computational fluid dynamics, engineering, transportation systems, and human behavior. You'd like to populate these models with cognitive agents like Agent Zero, who I'll introduce shortly. OK. Oh, here's another, some nice other views of that. Just I won't go on too long. But the idea is you're looking down on it in the lower left and from different views in the upper things. But you're tracking total number exposed and exposure in parts per million per second in the bottom. And so that's your measure of merit of your design is how do you limit exposure but we can we can we can track that and experiment and climate change of course is just an extremely slow version of this you can do the same sort of work for coupled environmental engineered and behavioral systems that's the thought back to infectious diseases so two other cases where well, now it's not toy at all these are all published and featured in various places. There's a nice piece in Nature about the global model, and they've all been published in journals of machine learning and you know, all, sorts of, all sorts of good places. Um, this is the national US model that we use to talk about containment strategies for pandemic flu, seasonal flu, other sorts of things. This now is not a toy. It's got 300 million agents. They're correct by census distri age distribution, every household, every hospital uh, travel between zip code and zip code. There's about 30,000 zip codes, and we have a big 
travel matrix estimated, you know, econometrically on if I pick someone from zip code I, what's the probability that they go to zip code J? So it's 30,000 squared. It's 900 million cells of travel probabilities. It's a monster. But uh, it's a useful monster. And if I start another bad, I, everything bad starts in LA, as I always say. So I start this standard uh, flu in LA. So black is a healthy pixel, red is a sick one, blue is someone who had it, whether they recovered or not. So we really care about the incidence curve. And this is about a 300 day epidemic. That's, you know, it's pretty bad. And you can do things like close schools, distribute vaccine, distribute antivirals, restrict travel, do all sorts of things, play a lot of games. And um, the, the, the complete Borges nightmare model is this six and a half billion agent planetary model, which is the only agent-based planetary infectious disease model. And this is another uh, one of these runs. We've run many of these runs for NIH for different pandemics, bird flu, swine flu, what have you. We did also some work on Ebola about likelihood of spread from West Africa. Okay, so these are agent-based models at the complete other end of the spectrum. But going back to the toy versus the high fidelity model, I think you can see that, you know, the toy model has the advantage that it doesn't, if it comes up with something surprising, you can explain to people why it did that. Where these things are more serious scientific instruments, but in many ways they're less persuasive. If they come up with something kooky looking, somebody can say, well, I'm not going to risk my career on that goofy idea. I don't know what the hell's going on in your crazy model and just go away. Um, so there's some sweet spot between the completely toy model and the high fidelity model, depending on what your objectives are. In this case, the objectives are purely scientific and can you build a planetary scale model, which, which we did. Many applications, uh, international travel restrictions and so on. Okay, so moving over to agent zero now, weaving through all of this stuff is human behavior, okay? These models are populated by individuals and uh, you know, so far the individuals have been very simple. You know, they don't have much apparatus. And the dominant approach has been the economics approach that began actually with von Neumann, honored to be giving a lecture in his name, and Morgenstern, who really invented the modern theory of games, game theory. And then it was advanced and perfected further by John Nash of A Beautiful Mind and the Nobel Prize, incidentally. Um, but all of these approaches assume perfect information and optimal behavior. It's the tradition of the rational actor, okay? So that homo economicus is a rational actor. Homo sapiens is not. Homo sapiens is driven by evolved machinery that's very useful, um, but involves unconscious, non-conscious emotions like fear. Uh, Rationality is not perfect. We don't have perfect information, and what information we have, we process badly. We're lousy at doing statistics. You know, we're not good orthodox Bayesians or anything of the, of the kind. And compounding all of it are conformity effects, so that the emotions and poor appraisals of others weigh heavily on our behavior, and in groups, we do all sorts of wild stuff we would never imagine doing alone, and that homo economicus would certainly never consider. All right, so what I've been doing in this work, Agent Zero, that Jessica showed you, um, was work funded by the NIH Pioneer Award, and it was about five years of work, honestly. Um, and the idea was, you know, you don't, you don't abandon prevailing theories just because there are counterexamples and anomalies, as there are in, there's lots of laboratory experiments showing that people aren't the rational actor. But people in economics or scientists, it's not enough to just say, there's problems with your theory. You have to give people an alternative <laughs> that's actually a functioning, mathematical, formal, computational alternative to the rational actor. And, <coughs> excuse me, though very provisional and simple and idealized, the idea of Agent Zero was to begin the development of that alternative, an alternative informed by contemporary neuroscience, but mathematical, 
so that, you know, when you say, I don't like homo economicus, and somebody says, well, what's your alternative? Except a pile of gripes. You can say, well, I have a real alternative. It's provisional and so forth. Uh, so the idea, if you think about it in philosophical terms, is, you know, Hume said famously, reason is a slave to the passions. So I want some module of this creature to be passionate, affective, emotional, non-deliberative, not even necessarily aware that they are forming associations of fear with certain things, all right? But, quoth Aristotle, man is a social animal. So I also want these agents to have passion, a limited form of reason, but to be connected to others so that others, other agents' passion and reason and deliberations can influence the agent. So the agent is driven by passion and reason and the passion and reason of others. And it's a sharp departure from homo economicus. I've tried to endow these preachers with an affective emotional module, a cognitive deliberative module, and social modules, all of which are backed up, or I like to say licensed by the neuroscience. I'm not modeling neurons or modeling the brain, but the representation of performance is licensed by that science. We can come back to all this. The inter individual modules interact to produce individual behavior, and when you put a lot of these agents together, they do all sorts of realistic, collective things, uh, not all of which are, are, are terrific. I mean, they engage in baseless you know, financial panic, genocide, uh, all kinds of social psychology. I've even got some nice, I replicate some social psychology experiments in populations of these creatures. Um, jury dynamics, all sorts of interesting excursions. It's all very crude. And as I say in the book, the idea is, you know, not to get the components finished, but to get the synthesis started. So I'd like to just tell you to how to build up this model, how I built it up, in the context of fear, which is an emotion uh, that's very primal, and it's of the emotions, whatever we mean by that word, it's quite well understood, at least from a neuroscientific standpoint. And it's implicated in mass flight, vaccine refusal, uh, financial panic, Salem witch hunts, stampedes, contagious violence. Fear is a big deal, and we know a little bit about it. So I thought, let's instantiate this model uh, in that context. All right, the, the circuitry in question is, is identified. It's the amygdala and associated um, areas of the brain. Um, and if you, what happens is that there's some sound, if it's an auditory stimulus, you know, a lion roars in your face, then <laughs> there's this circuitry that illuminates the amygdala, which in, then produces freezing, increases in blood pressure, release of hormones, all sorts of things that are evolutionarily beneficial, all right? And we know what, we've done a lot of work on this. There are stains of the thing. This is the culprit, okay. Uh, it's innate, it's automatic, it's fast, and it's really inaccessible to deliberation, which makes it very interesting from a social science standpoint. It's not a strategy, it's not a choice. It's just an evolved reaction to certain kinds of stimulus. And Joe Ledoux, who's one of the great figures in this area, talks about a low road, which is this quick and dirty road to the amygdala, and then a delayed more deliberative pathway. So I throw a snake in your, in your feet. You immediately freeze. It's not a choice. You just freeze. Uh, <laughs> but then you look at the thing and say, Josh, you shouldn't have thrown a rubber snake at me. That's just not fun. <laughs> you know. And you decide, OK, it's not a real snake. And the, f the amygdala goes away, and the fear dissipates. But the first reaction is innate, automatic, fast. And you can learn these associations. You're equipped with an associative machinery that allows you to associate things. And I'll talk about fear conditioning. So the classic example, <coughs> excuse me, would be a case where I put a shock cuff on the subject. They get a little shock, which is an innately aversive experience. And if I just give them a shock, then the there'll be recruitment of blood to the amygdala and other signatures of amygdala activation. If I just show you a blue light, there's nothing. You don't, there's no amygdala recruitment. Nothing happens. You just see a blue light, so on. But if I show you a blue light and then shock you, and do blue light shock, blue light shock, blue light shock a bunch of times, and then I show you the blue light alone, you get the same registry as if I'd given you the shock cuff. So you associate the blue light with the shock, 
And then the blue light alone, you've been conditioned to associate those, and the blue light alone elicits the same response as the shock. Okay, and there's some very simple mathematics that I used in constructing Agent Zero called the Rescorla Wagner model that captures this in a very crude but revealing way. I like this headset. We'll see if this works. And I, I don't need to go through this except to say that you simply have some maximum association, which is this lambda idea, which is just, you can imagine that as one. And after continued pairings, the association between the blue light and the shock gets stronger and stronger. That's all. That's the whole idea of this model. It just gets stronger and stronger. The more trials, pairings you have, the more closely you identify the stimulus with the aversive case. All right? And I said this before. Um, and this also is a very old idea, but it wasn't mathematized until the 70s. But Hume wrote nicely about all of this. He said, after the constant conjunction of two objects, the blue light and the shock, we are determined by custom alone to expect the one from the appearance of the other, having found in many instances that two kinds of objects, flame and heat, snow and cold, have always been conjoined together. If flame or snow be presented anew to the senses, the mind is carried by custom to expect heat or cold. It is not by reasoning moreover, that we form the connection. All these operations, these associative habits, all these operations are a species of natural instinct which no reasoning or process of the thought and understanding is able either to produce or to prevent. So this component of our behavior, the association between these aversive things and initially neutral stimuli, is a deep a non-conscious apparatus of great survival value, but inaccessible to ratiocination, all right? Um, Ledoux talks about these as survival circuits, and it's true, you know, Pleistocene man never encountered a car, you know, but when a car whips around the corner, we freeze just like he froze when a hippo charged at him out of the brush, right? It's the same conserved uh, neurochemical computing architecture has been conserved across evolution. And it's very uh, the, the synaptic plasticity, it's called, permits us to adapt that machinery to encode novel threats. It's very, very valuable, but it's also very dangerous, right? If you're subjected to, you know, Vietnam, you've got Bell uh, shock, I mean, light shock fear. For Pavlov's dog, it's Bell food salivation, all right? but. You know, if you're subjected to constant associations between the Arab world and 9-11, you, yes, you were trained to think the Quran is a kind of terrorist handbook or something, you know? And in history, there are other trials that engender tremendous distrust. I mean, Tuskegee left a deep scar of enduring distrust to the medical establishment. Um, you know, you get one salient, surprising, adverse drug reaction it can produce widespread vaccine refusal by the same sort of contagious fear apparatus. Capital flight from some sudden devaluation of assets, you know, the Great Depression. Um, so the machinery is very useful, but it can also end up being, you know, producing mass reactions that are really unwarranted and associations that are unwarranted. So one component of Agent Zero is fear. But I'm saying it's contagious fear, and we've got some papers on this and some nice mathematical models. But again, you know, someone could say, well, those models are dandy, but is there any neural basis, any license for assuming that fear could actually spread in, in a way that's analogous to a contagion? Yeah. So here is the earlier uh, subject, is, is the top amygdala thing. All right, so here's the experiment, observational fear condition. I'm going to do the same experiment I told you about before. But the real subject is someone who's wearing no shock cuff. He's just watching the first guy be conditioned. All right? So the real subject, so this is the amygdala response after conditioning of the subject we discussed before. Blue light shock, blue light shock, blue light alone, amygdala. Now, the second person is B. He's simply watching the first guy. 
endure these associative trials, this fear conditioning experiment. So he's watching David be blue light shock, blue light shock, blue light shock. And then I show him the blue light and his amygdala lights up. So you don't need to have direct stimulus to form the association. So yeah, there's some grounds for thinking of this as not requiring direct stimulus, all right, and so perhaps contagious. So one ingredient of agent zero is emotion. Um, reason, as Hume said, may be a slave to the passions, but reasoning does occur, but it occurs poorly. We don't have perfect information, and we make systematically erroneous appraisals of it. Some of these are very well documented, and I won't go into them. It's safe to say that I've given uh, agent zero a very limited type of rationality where he can form some probability estimate based on observation. So he's feeling things that have nothing to do with observation or not conscious, but he's also got a component that's calculating um, probabilities, albeit badly and crudely. And to make matters worse, agents driven by strong emotions like fear, doing bad statistics on crummy data, also influence one another. And conformist pressures can produce convergence on bad counterproductive behavior. Conformity effects are widely documented. Again, OK, is there a neural basis? And there's very fascinating uh, neuroscience on conformity uh, by Ethan Cross, among others, um, that found this is also a PNAS paper. When rejection is powerfully elicited, areas that support the sensory components of physical pain become active. So it literally hurts to be rejected. You recruit the same areas as physical pain. And he's got very elegant ways of measuring this and showing that there's very strong overlap between areas recruited by social rejection and areas recruited by physical pain. So as he writes, conform, you conform because rejection literally hurts. And he writes, these results give, give new meaning to the idea that rejection hurts. Rejection and physical pain are similar, not only in that they're distressing, they share a common somatosensory representation as well. So. Ingredient three is some type of network weights. What other people uh, a feeling and so forth are weigh on you. You're not just an island. Man is a social animal, and we're going to try to capture that in some sort of interagent weighting. All right. And in the book and in the model, uh, all of which is published and available on the Princeton website, you can run these models yourself. You can teach them. It's all open. So it may be nonsense, but it's completely replicable nonsense, OK? Um, so the big picture, I'm going to just show you a run, and then we'll, we'll conclude. Um, but the big picture here is I'm going to show you agents occupy a landscape of indigenous sites. And you can imagine them as occupying powers in a military setting, all right? There's an action they can take, destroy some sites or not, blow up a village that I'm in. And they experience, their experience on this landscape of aversive stimulus and poor statistics produces a disposition, a real number, to take this action. So some sites that you'll see are going to be inactive and benign. Others are going to be active and fear-inducing, like ambushers, all right? Indigenous bad guys. I take no sides in all of this. I'm not usually rooting for the rebels in any of these models. But for the moment, let's just say you're the occupying agent zeros and they're occupying a landscape. Agents fear condition on local stimuli. This is their passion component. So they're associating these sites with a bad event, an ambush. And after a while, they're asking, what's the likelihood that a random site is going to ambush me? Right? That's the second part, is their sample from their, their own experience. And that, that the, the sum of those is their disposition to wipe out the village. Okay? But they also experience the dispositions of other agents. And if the total is greater than some threshold, they take action. They destroy the sites. They flee. They refuse vaccine. They dump assets. They find guilty in the jury chamber, what have you. Here's the idea, all right? And one of the central runs here is agent zero <coughs> is going to be a fixed agent of this type in the lower left of the screen. The other two agents are also of the agent zero type, and they're connected by these arrows that have weights. Um, the yellow is the landscape of indigenous people. Um, and I've distinguished them slightly just so you can see that they're different. You know, but there's, there's a whole lattice of individual yellow indigenous sites. Occasionally, as in the upper right, they do ambush the blue occupiers. All right? 
And there's an association between being a yellow site and being doing something scary. So a la the Rescorla Wagner equations, they form a fear association between yellow sites and an aversive event, like the shock cup. So this is not conscious, it's just fear learning on this landscape of stimuli. All right? They also calculate a probability within their vision, which is a small radius, of the likelihood that a yellow site will turn into an orange bad site. It's just the relative frequency of orange within their vision, the moving average over some memory window, which we can give them various memories and so on. All right? If their fear and their probability, weighted by everybody else's fear and probability, if those exceed some threshold, they wipe out sites within their vicinity. These are these dark blood red sites. Now, Agent Zero is down here in the southwest. I'm going to fix him in his current position. He never sees any orange sites. He's never subjected to any attacks. All right? Uh, so he has no grounds for retaliating on anyone. He's formed no associations through aversive stimuli, and he has no empirical basis for taking action against the indigenous people. But he wipes out his village, nonetheless, on the lower layer. So I'm going to show you this sort of slaughter of innocents through purely dispositional contagion, all right? He joins this whole thing. He's in the lower left. The others are moving around the landscape. Whoops, sorry. They are stimulated. He is not. They retaliate, and so does he. So he joins the lynch mob, even though he's got nothing against black people. He's never had a bad experience with a black person. He has no evidence of black wrongdoing, but he joins the lynch mob. And what's really interesting is that, you know, he can do that in the group um, because the total disposition in the group exceeds his action threshold. Even though alone, he would never take that action. All right, and as a pun on the word conditioning, I used la condition humaine. But the idea is that this is a type of self-betrayal that is possible in groups. You wouldn't do that alone, but you do it in the group. And you may be the only agent with that ordering, and despite being negatively disposed, you can even act first, which is the most central and perverse result of the whole exercise, in which Agent Zero is actually the first actor when he would never act alone. Um, and a lot of the social science literature that takes um, network effects seriously assumes imitation of behavior. Imitation of behavior is the mechanism. But imitation of behavior can't tell you how the first guy acts because there's no one to imitate. So how do you account for the first actor? And how do you even make the first actor the one who's negatively disposed toward the action? So Agent Zero produces this, I find, disturbing and right? He goes first even though he's negatively disposed as a solo actor. So it's an unsettling picture, I hope. I'll read, just I apologize, this is bad PowerPoint etiquette, but I'll read it anyway. So the overall picture of Homo sapiens reflected in these interpretations of Agent Zero is unsettling. Here we have a creature evolved, that is selected for high susceptibility to unconscious fear conditioning. Fear, conscious or otherwise, can be acquired rapidly through direct exposure or indirectly through fearful others. This primal emotion is moderated by a more recently evolved deliberative module, which, at best, operates suboptimally on incomplete data and whose risk appraisals are normally biased further by affect itself. Both affective and cognitive modules, moreover, are powerfully influenced by the dispositions of similar equally limited and unconsciously driven agents. Is it any wonder that collectivities of interacting agents of this type, the agent zero type, can exhibit mass violence, dysfunctional health behaviors, and financial panic? And I would submit that no, it's not any wonder. But there hasn't been a model that produces it. And this is one provisional step in that direction. Okay, in the book, there are many examples that are implemented, including uh, 
a replication of a very famous social psychology experiment on conformity, the Latin A. Darley experiment. Uh, lots of other work from endogenous cycles of uh, economic demand, endogenous network structure, a very different form of a different um, mechanism of network formation than preferential attachment. Well, it's a hom homophily of affect uh, mechanism. There's a big agenda for agent zero. As I showed you these large scale models, and I showed you this neurocognitively plausible agent, but you know there's a giant agenda to populate larger models with agents of this sort, calibrate the resulting synthetic models to real spatiotemporal data, um, do lab experiments, do use social media. I mean, there's a whole empirical agenda that needs to be pursued. And many variations on this agent should be explored. And as I say, the idea was build something simple and transparent that generates important regularities in a way that respects the evolving neuroscience. And maybe by this approach, we can gain a deeper generative type of understanding of social dynamics, improve our understanding, and maybe even improve our behavior. So on that optimistic note, uh, one other, one other thing. I, I will, I'll end there, really. But the idea is, how does all this work relate to the public square and the public discussion? And I think, you know, the role for theoretical work like this is not to tell people what to think, but maybe tell them how to think about complex issues of public concern, like violence and panic and these sorts of things. <laughs> so it's never about like what policy to adopt, but it might be useful in framing and informing dialogues on crucial issues, how to inject humility and detachment into a partisan discussion. And I think there's a lot of appetite for that kind of voice. And I think the scientific community can and should play that role um, in society. Thank you. Sure, fine, whatever questions, please do wait to ask your question until you have the microphone in hand. Yeah, I was uh, interested in knowing if any type of modeling like what you presented for the Anastasi has been done on uh, other civilizations that have declined where there are many theories explaining the possible reasons. I was thinking of places like Easter Island or Angkor Wat or Cahokia or even something like Bhopal, what happened there? Yeah, I'm not, I mean, not, it's, it's not literature I've really kept up with, but yeah, there's a lot. There's a, compu there's a whole book on computational archaeology edited by Tim Kohler, K-O-H-L-E-R, that was recently published that assembles a lot of this work that really followed from the Anasazi uh, model. But yeah, there's the decline of Mesopotamian civilization and uh, there's also a lot of reconstruction of not quite so ancient uh, segregation dynamics in, in Israel, for example. So there's a lot of work that tries to reconstruct observed spatiotemporal patterns. But I would refer you to that book for more ancient civilizations. I think Easter Island is among the things they've tried to do, the Norse surge, all these other episodes. So it's a good question, and I think there's work in that area. It's a book called Computational Archaeology. which I think we kind of accidentally founded. Hi there. Hi. Um, I was kind of curious whether you've uh, designed any experiments to, to sort of field test um, Agent Zero. So as in put people in a certain situation and test that group as if they were all, you know, an Agent Zero type of test. You yeah. Know. Not, not a lot to date. There's a lot of work on trying to see if agents of this sort could replicate contagion of sentiments as, 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 you know, there are a lot of people who do Twitter analysis and sentiment analysis using social media data. And there is, there is work going on to see if agents of this sort can duplicate the contagion of attitudes about things like vaccine and so on. But lab experiments would be really fun to construct and I'd, Welcome recommendations along those lines, but I have not designed those, but I have people who, you know, want to. So I think it's a great thing to do. Uh, my, my question, I'm wondering, 
Now, this might break your computational systems, but have you ever tried to model with Agent Zero a deliberative body such as, oh, the US Congress? <laughs> <laughs> or would you consider it? I don't, need, no, I don't need any reason component to model the US Congress, <laughs> right? I just need a, an applause, uh, a power drive and an applause meter for a brain is probably what I would zero order model. But I've done a lot of, the, in the book there's a quite an extended exercise on jury dynamics where the, uh, the agents are, are, are subjected to, you know, if you think of something like O.J. Simpson's trial or something like this. So there's quite a lot of work on conformity effects in juries. And I have, the, in the book, there's a whole section on dynamics of trials when, again, it's the same sort of situation where I might acquit if I were alone, but because of these conformist pressures and other observable patterns, the jury as a whole finds guilty when no individual would alone have found guilty. So I think juries, uh, FDA approval uh, for drugs, I mean, there's a whole bunch of settings where you could imagine the group being of this sort and try to reconstruct uh, outcomes and so forth. I haven't tried to do anything as, as big as the US Congress, but I, as I say, I'm not, I'm not sure all the components are necessary for that. Yeah. Uh, just wondering if uh, there is a free study available in the War of the Worlds with Orson Welles in 38. Yeah, yeah, that's a good, uh, that's a great question. Yeah. So has anything done to confirm your theory? In the that would be a good candidate. No, I mean, I think that's a nice example. Yeah. yeah. We have time for two more questions. So all of the models that you showed required some level of uh, tuning. Is there any quality for a problem that gives you some indication of how much fine tuning is needed for that problem? That's a great question. And um, in, in some respects, the, the capacity to do fine tuning is a bit of a hazard. Uh, in a lot of these models, you know, there are many freely adjustable parameters that we'd like to clamp with empirical <laughs> work. Um, and I think there's a big temptation, and sir, you mentioned this archeological literature. I think, it's, I think it's kind of rife in that area where you, know, you have a lot of latitude to tune the thing. And one of the advanced scientific advance, it would be a scientific advance to reduce that latitude through measurement, if you know what I'm saying. I'm not trying to be elliptical. I'm, I'm, I think your point is well taken. Um, and from model to model, if you're, it depends on the objectives and the scale of the model and the available data. But I think a, a central problem in this scientific program is precisely to constrain these models with data. So the latitude for fine tuning is limited, more limited than it is today. But it's one of the reasons you build the model, again, to come back to this other point, the models can tell you, look, the outcome depends sensitively on this thing. Go measure that, right? It may turn out that the performance of the model is very insensitive over some t for some of the parameters or rules. They really did get the same thing no matter what. So we don't need to measure that so well. But there may be thresholds and important nonlinearities and sharp changes in the performance of the model in areas we don't measure very well. So it tells you, that, look, go measure that thing really carefully. Because without that, we are just kind of dialing parameter values. It's not, it's not where you want to be as a science. Yeah, I'm wondering if uh, some of the things you did with the Anasazi yeah. follow through what happens to them. Have you others tried to do that in a predictive way about things that are going on in a large scale now? For example, what are the probabilities will deal well with climate change? What will happen in the Mideast in terms of outcomes? Has anybody tried that kind of predictive work? No, <laughs> but I would say that I do distinguish between explanatory activity and predictive activity. So for example, I mean, you know, if you say plate, tec plate tectonics explains earthquakes, but it doesn't let us predict them. And electrostatics explains lightning, but it doesn't let us predict it. And except in some quarters, evolution explains speciation, but we can't even tell you the next flu strain for next year. We can't even match a vaccine. Um, but nonetheless, plate tectonics is explanatory and useful, and it reveals core 
dynamics and mechanisms. And I think at this stage of agent-based computational modeling, it's a, more an explanatory goal than a predictive one. And an example, for example, in economics, Rob Axtell and John Giancopoulos and Don Farmer, all associated with the Santa Fe Institute, and now also Oxford, have reconstructed the housing bubble, for example, uh, in, in really, you know, in, in great detail with a large volume of data. So it's not a zillion freely adjustable parameters and can I grow the narrative on a computer. Um, they've really said, look, is there, was there a financial bubble and can we actually show that with different large scale data and in an agent-based computational model. So, you know, I think, I think I, I'd like to be able to say that, you know, we will eventually get into an area where I can do something like, for epidemic modeling, for example, maybe we can get to weather forecasting, where I say, I'm not going to tell you landfall for a hurricane, but I can give you a cone within which I can tell you some sort of probabilities with some kind of intelligent confidence. So I think that type of prediction is within reach. And I also think statistical prediction, where I'm saying this will be the distribution, but not point estimates. So anyway, that's sort of what my good, great question. All right. Thank you, Josh, very much for yeah, informing us.